When it comes to determining how wars end, the will of the population and troops to continue has often been as important as materiel or tactics. Indeed, I've heard it said before that the United States doesn't so much lose wars as it loses interest. And the tactic of weaker powers simply outlasting larger and stronger ones until they give up and go home has been the downfall of many great power military campaigns and is basically the signature manoeuvre of countries like Afghanistan or Vietnam. In Ukraine, Russia's initial 2022 offensive appeared to be based more on optimism and speed than attrition and exhaustion. But now there's a much wider understanding that this war is likely to be a long, hard slog, and that while the taking of territory certainly has some value, at a macro level I'd argue that Ukraine, Russia, and Ukraine's allies are all leading on exhaustion as a strategy. Whether that means burning through the equipment and military resources available to the opponent, or exhausting the will of the population and politicians to carry on making the sacrifices needed to carry on the war. So one of the key questions predicting the war in 2024 isn't just who has the resources to continue, but who has the political will and public support to do so. And so with fatigue and war exhaustion now a topic once again making its way into the media, I thought today was the time to take a better look at the concept and ask what it's likely to mean for the war in Ukraine going forward. To do that, I'm going to go over a couple of topics in sequence. We'll start with some theory and history, asking what war exhaustion is and how it tends to come about. Basically, if you've ever wanted to win a war with a superpower by running down the clock, that'll be the section for you. Then we'll ask in a strategic sense why the various parties with an interest in the war in Ukraine might be tempted to rely heavily on attrition and exhaustion-based strategies, and who, if anyone, is winning the battle for public opinion and political will in Ukraine, Russia, and critical Ukrainian allies like the United States, European, and United Kingdom. Because while it might be Russians and Ukrainians who are actually fighting this war, the way it ultimately ends probably owes almost as much to decisions made in Brussels or Washington, D.C., as it does the bravery and sacrifice of Ukrainian troops at the front. So it's probably best to start with the basics. At a time when troops trying to advance in Ukraine are struggling with the onset of winter, and where the media is due for additional coverage on the topic of Ukraine fatigue, I thought it might be worth taking a step back for a moment and asking, from a historical perspective, what is war exhaustion or fatigue? How does it manifest? And how can nations leverage it to win wars? Because it is a reality that some wars in history have been worn with fast, decisive battlefield actions. Whether you're talking about ancient actions where an opposing king might be captured on the field, or decisive modern era campaigns like Desert Storm in 1991, a decisive victory on the field of battle is always a possibility, and one that is often going to be attractive to military planners. But as we covered in our video on war termination, most videos don't end with total, absolute, decisive victory for one side or the other. Instead, they continue until factors that might include military, economic, or political and social exhaustion push the negotiating positions of both sides together to a point where a peace can be agreed. But here's a question for you. When we're talking about exhaustion, what exactly is getting exhausted? Often the best answer is whatever is critical to the ability of a country to carry on the war that runs out first. Carrying on a modern war is a complex and demanding process. It requires a range of inputs from money to manpower to munitions. And if you exhaust your supply of anything critical, you might find yourself in a very hard position. In a way, it's kind of like being stranded out in the middle of the outback. It doesn't matter if the back of your ute's packed with enough food to last you for three months. If you don't have any water on you, it's all pretty academic. So if you're trying to win a war by wearing out your opponent, there's all sorts of things you could try to exhaust. Maybe the target is the financial resources of the state, trying to force your opponent to shovel so much money into the fire so quickly for so long that eventually that smoke plume consumes all of their available reserves, they're forced to print currency, and sail towards hyperinflation and potential economic collapse. Or maybe the goal is to exhaust the supply of military materiel. This is something we talk about and track a lot on this channel. You can have the most dedicated army in the world with lots of money to pay them, but in the end, money and munitions are not immediately 100% interchangeable. You could make it rain $100 bills on the battlefield, but you'd probably get better results dropping bombs as opposed to banknotes. But often when we're talking about war exhaustion, we're not talking about stuff, we're talking about people and their will to continue. That might mean members of the political leadership and a country's political elite who have decided the war is no longer doing it for them, Maybe they miss being able to buy property overseas or travel the world on their yachts and as a result would like the war to end sooner rather than later and become willing to use their power in order to make it happen. One of the obvious problems with trying to employ this sort of technique, however, is that if you are a member of a country's political or economic elite, then you are probably far more able to insulate yourselves from the constant impact of a war 
than just about anyone else. No matter how hard the sanction squeeze is placed on North Korea, for example, it's probably never going to be Kim Jong-un and those immediately around him that end up going hungry. Far less insulated from the consequences of war are going to be the troops at the front. And history is replete with examples where the political leadership might be willing to fight on, the nation might hypothetically have the resources to fight on, and indeed the public back home might be willing to stay the course. But if the troops in the trenches start turning to their commanders, pointing at no man's land and saying, well then, after you, sir, then the national war effort might be approaching a potential point of failure. Military exhaustion historically can manifest in a variety of ways. One famous historical example might be the 1917 French army mutinies, which affected perhaps half of French infantry divisions fighting on the Western Front, and often involved troops saying that they were willing to continue defending their positions, but were not willing to accept orders to continue attacking German positions. At its most extreme, manifestations of military exhaustion can become points of failure. For example, when troops decide en masse that they no longer like their officers or existing political leaders, note the fact that they are the ones holding all the guns, and decide to enact political change at bayonet point as a result. But of course, this is the 21st century, and we'd never see a military or paramilitary unit launching a major mutiny and starting a road trip towards the national capital, now would we? Finally, even if you have a determined political leadership class, significant remaining national resources, and the tools to maintain discipline in the military, there is still the question of support for the war effort back home. And if you happen to be leading an aspiring insurgency or a smaller nation, and it's your great ambition to see off or defeat a great power, this historically might be the best place to start. Because whether you're talking about the war in Vietnam or the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, there are plenty of examples of forces that could never hope to destroy the military capacity of the countries they were fighting, nonetheless being able to make it to the finish line and arguably secure a victory, not so much by defeating their opponent in the field, but instead by just continuing day after day, month after month, year after year, continuing to exact costs, until the home front ultimately just became sick of it. And when given a choice between losing a war or losing an election, there are often going to be a lot of incentives for politicians to choose the former. Now, I would never be one to suggest that any two wars are exactly the same, but if you're looking for a very generalised model of the way public war enthusiasm versus war weariness, fatigue, etc. tends to change over time, there are a number of historical conflicts you might be able to split into a couple of distinct phases. In phase one, you get the rally round the flag effect and war enthusiasm is likely to be high. Whether you're talking about World War I in 1914 or Ukraine in 2022, you might see volunteers flocking to recruitment stations while a collective surge of adrenaline seems to pass through members of the public. Members of the public will go into the war with a certain conception of the way things should play out, a certain implicit or explicit understanding of what war should be. Then what will happen is reality and those expectations will start to collide. If reality exceeds expectations, like for example after the success of Desert Storm or after the Ukrainian victory in Kharkiv in 2022, you can actually see public enthusiasm and support jump upwards. But if you were expecting the troops home by Christmas and all you get instead are mounting casualty reports and no end in sight, then enthusiasm might fade as expectations are revised downwards at least as long as no visible progress is being made and the end isn't in sight. Now, obviously, those changes aren't linear and there are a lot of factors that go into them. But I do have a rather complex thesis to suggest why war exhaustion in societies might generally mount over time. And that complex thesis is that war in general is pretty damn awful. And despite the fact that war is something human societies have been doing basically since the beginning of recorded history at the very least, societies often seem to be caught off guard again and again by just how much pain and sacrifice is often involved in the whole process. If you're looking for some of the factors that might turn a public against a war over time, it probably pays to start with some of the costs a war is likely to impose. Human losses, economic deprivation, or even just restrictions on quality of life and liberty, like, for example, wartime censorship measures. During parts of the Second World War, for example, Britain had some pretty stringent blackout restrictions, requiring people to turn off or block out the lights in their homes, so that German bombers operating at night didn't have giant gleaming clusters of city lights to aim their bombs at. But despite the military purpose of the restrictions, you can bet the Karens, both male and female, of 1940s era Britain would on occasion complain bitterly of the inconvenience caused by the restrictions, or in other cases, write of their immense opposition to the noise caused by the defending anti-aircraft guns that were trying to bring down the attacking German bombers. 
and that's a case where the inconvenience was being caused to the people the measures were trying to defend. When we're talking about the war in Ukraine, often minor impacts are being felt in countries that are not directly engaged in the fighting. There are three other factors I want to call out beyond just the cost being incurred. They historically often seem to have played into social cohesion during wartime and public war support. The first is basically expectancy theory, a belief that if you take a certain action, consequences will follow, and those consequences or the consequences of inaction justify you taking that action. If you think that by putting in extra effort at the office, you are likely to be recognised and promoted, then you might be more likely to put in that work than in a universe where the only reward for doing good work was to receive more work. A similar calculus can play out in relation to a war. If you think that by pressing on and sacrificing, you will in the end achieve a sort of victory, then you're more likely to continue than if you believe the whole thing is hopeless. Similarly, if you're fighting a war like the war in Ukraine as a defender, and you believe the results of inaction or defeat would be catastrophic for you and your country, then you are probably more likely to press on almost no matter the cost, because the expected result of inaction is simply too expensive to countenance. Another element that commonly shows up are societal conceptions of fairness, namely how fairly the burdens and costs of war are shared across a society. Basically, people might be okay with horrendous conditions as long as they're all in it together, But if some are suffering while others are pretending the war basically isn't happening, that can cause resentment. A classic lightning rod issue in this respect is often conscription. And in particular, who's eligible, who's exempt, who is actually called up, and how fair that process is. During the American Civil War, for example, there was immense controversy caused by the practice of substitution in the South. Basically, this meant if you were conscripted but happened to have a whole bunch of money then if you could pay or convince someone else that wasn't themselves liable for conscription to go in your place, then your name was ticked off the list and you could spend the rest of the war hanging around on your plantation, while some other sod got acquainted with the marvellous battlefield phenomena of grapeshot, typhoid and mud on your behalf. In Ukraine, there are currently debates ongoing about the conscription and mobilisation process, including who should be exempt, how many should be called up, how long should those who have been called up serve, and what should the process be for rotation. Historically, public debates over conscription have often been bitterly contested, and issues of exemption, evasion or corruption in the process have sometimes been caustic to national morale and war enthusiasm. The third point I wanted to make here is that often when it comes to public opinion and war exhaustion, you're arguably talking about one of the few areas where perception does trump reality. That's going to make a degree of sense because your public can't base their opinion on an objective view of how the war is actually going, only on how they think the war is going. An arguable example here might be the Tet Offensive during the Vietnam War. Militarily, you could argue the attack was a disaster for North Vietnam and the Viet Cong. It didn't result in significant territories being taken and held, it didn't cause the collapse of South Vietnamese forces, and the cost in killed and wounded was enormous. The Viet Cong units in particular had gotten absolutely wrecked, but the American media and public were shocked by the whole affair and attitudes towards the war soured further. The disconnect can be even greater in information-controlled societies. In 1944, at a time where a tide of American defence production was rolling ever closer to the Japanese home islands, only 10% of the Japanese population, according to post-war surveys, said they had been convinced at the time that Japan would lose the war. It was only much later, when bombing attacks on the home islands scaled up, that reality started to hit and public perceptions shifted. This raises an important issue if you're trying to rely on war exhaustion to defeat an opponent. It's often not enough to make sure they're losing if you can't convince their public that that's what's happening. There's also a giant caveat here that should probably be mentioned before we move on to Ukraine in earnest. And that is that even in a democracy, just because a group, be it the public or military personnel, experience war exhaustion, that doesn't mean the war is automatically lost or going to end. In a dictatorship, this makes sense because obviously the government isn't directly bound to public opinion. But even in a democracy, voters usually don't cast their vote based on a single issue. You might, for example, be against your government's policy on aggressively invading other countries and taking their territory. But hey, look, if they're planning some tax cuts and a new public holiday, who are you to vote for the other guy? And so candidates or parties who support the continuation of a war can continue to win, even with a majority anti-war population. If you want to get a sense of perspective on this, recently there have been some news articles in the US covering polling results suggesting that somewhere between 41 and 45% of Americans think too much aid is going to Ukraine. Often this is cast as a catastrophic number. But by comparison, in late 2009, 
I found surveys showing anywhere from 42 to 58% opposition to the US mission in Afghanistan. The result was a war which continued for more than a decade past that point. The Iraq war was unpopular for a lot of the time that it was being fought, and depending on your source, the Vietnam War became net unpopular in the USA sometime in the late 1960s. But in each of those cases, the mission continued for years after the loss of overall majority public support. Something perhaps to keep in mind, both when predicting future American actions in Ukraine and also future Russian ones. Some degree of anti-war sentiment is almost always going to be present in case of a major conflict. The question is often not just whether that sentiment is there, it's how it will impact government policy. Similarly, when troops experience exhaustion, the results can be inconsistent. In Ukraine, for example, you don't have to look too hard to find examples of troops complaining about just about everything, from supplies to the climate and conditions to the actions of certain officers and leaders. But often when you're reading interviews with Ukrainian personnel, even when they acknowledge immense difficulties and hard conditions, they'll often caveat it all by saying that despite it all, they intend to fight on and they expect to win. In other cases, armies have pressure applied to them and take the approach that when the going gets tough, the tough get going right out of uniform and off the battlefield. So if we want to make all this theory applicable to the war in Ukraine, it's probably time to start talking about the Ukrainian context and the strategy of those involved. In Ukraine, it seems that most of the parties involved have at least some motivation to try and win by wearing the other side out. The dream of a quick Russian battlefield victory probably died with the withdrawal from Kyiv in 2022. While for Ukraine, even before the summer offensive of 2023, Wearing out Russian military capacity and political and social will almost had to be part of the equation. After all, for the Ukrainians, there's basically no chance that this ends with them raising the blue and yellow over the Kremlin. With the right resources and decision-making, the Ukrainians can hypothetically take back all of their territory by military means. They can also apply escalating levels of pressure and pain to the Russian Federation and its military. But as long as things like Russian nuclear capabilities are in play, a march on Moscow isn't. And so some of the more credible Ukrainian theories of victory put forward basically come down to leveraging the military capability and determination of the Ukrainian people and military, coupled with the superior financial and economic resources of Ukraine's various allies, until Russia either can't practically continue or chooses to negotiate terms. An attrition or exhaustion-based strategy is also reinforced by Western policy objectives. Fear of uncontrolled escalation has been a feature of Western decision-making from day one. Sharp and decisive escalations might sometimes be viewed with suspicion and concern, so there may be a temptation instead to simply try and wear the Russians down over time, steadily increase the pressure, until eventually, in the absolute ideal scenario for the NATO powers, Russia simply decides to go home. In a sense, you could argue that strategy aligns with what history tells us about what the cheapest ways to deter or counter an opponent are. Generally, the most expensive form of deterrence is failed deterrence, where you actually have to end up fighting a peer-on-peer -peer conflict. Conventional deterrence, where you build up your own military capabilities and maintain a high level of readiness, well, that's cheaper because obviously you're not being shot at, but it still can be pretty expensive. Often what is more efficient is to find a conflict your opponent is fighting and feed in the resources necessary to grind them down there. For the Soviet Union People's Republic of China, supporting North Vietnam was probably a far cheaper way to inflict a defeat on the United States than confronting America directly. In a similar way, supporting Ukraine is probably one of the less expensive and less risky ways to break down the military capacity of the Russian Federation and reduce its ability to pose a threat to the alliance in the future. Strangely enough, however, there might be some evidence that Russia is hoping that same logic applies in reverse. The Russian military has not demonstrated a capacity to make more than local advances against Ukrainian forces supplied by their NATO allies since relatively early on in the invasion. If this just came down to a game of raw material and financial endurance, then the math is clearly, crushingly, not in Russia's favour. But at the same time, uncontrolled and dramatic escalation against NATO in order to try and secure some short-term decisive victory would also probably be ruinous because a Russian military that is struggling enough with the fight in Ukraine probably wouldn't fare very well if NATO ever decided to drop the proverbial hammer. But interpreting some Russian decisions and comments that Putin has made, it might be that Russia has decided it doesn't have to beat a Ukraine supported by the West, it just has to wait until Ukraine is no longer supported by the West. Putin said in October that he believes the Ukrainian military would only last a month without Western support. And if you can think of that reduction in aid as a Russian strategic objective, then fostering war exhaustion probably becomes a key imperative for Russia. Only for them, it's not just about wearing down the Ukrainian military or people. 
Arguably instead, the target with the greatest rewards is the will and opinion of members of the public and politicians in the various countries that are keeping Ukraine supplied. Given a choice between fostering war exhaustion in Kyiv or Washington, D.C., you can argue that the Russian war effort would actually benefit more from the latter. But before we get to opinion and will in the United States, we have to start with Ukraine. Because while there are some views of this conflict out there that discount the agency of the Ukrainians as a people and as a nation, realistically, it's their willingness to continue, to fight on and accept the cost of doing so, that is absolutely central to all of this. All of the military aid and munitions in the world won't matter if the Ukrainians aren't willing to use them. And it's worth mentioning that it seems like one of the great Russian miscalculations of 2022 was the assumption that a lot of Ukrainians would simply roll over or greet them with flowers when they invaded. What they got instead were Molotov cocktails and gunfire, and here we are. But it needs to be acknowledged that the Ukrainians have been fighting a hard, casualty-intensive war. And there's every possibility the winter that comes is going to be miserable again. Not just for the troops at the front or families who are without their loved ones, but for a civilian population that may again be on the receiving end of a Russian strategic bombing campaign. And beyond the general point of war just being miserable and costly for the population in general, there are a couple of factors, at least anecdotally, that often feature in Ukrainian public discourse. Major issues include mobilisation and the fairness of the mobilisation process, as we discussed earlier, as well as the ongoing fight against issues like corruption. Overpaying for military supplies during peacetime might mean the taxpayer gets ripped off. Overpaying for supplies during wartime might mean some of the troops go without. So it's not that unusual in Ukraine to see new anti-corruption cases being opened and officials being fired. For example, when Zelensky fired the officials responsible for military conscription at a regional level. But if you ask what Ukrainian public approval is for figures like President Zelensky, who has made it very clear that his intention is to fight on and not to give any territorial concessions to the invading Russians, well, the answer is still, based on the polling we have, extremely high. As in, levels almost any Western political leader can barely hope for high. And you would think that if Ukrainians at large disagreed with the most important strategic decision being taken by the president, we might expect to see that flow through into the approval ratings. For the most part, we don't, but that doesn't mean you don't see some interesting spin on the figures. In covering this topic, I just had to pull out this article by Russia Today, because I think it's a relatively good example of some of these simple ways that you can use language, headline, and the occasional artful omission in order to take a set of figures and then violently invert or twist their meaning. In this case, the headline begins with Zelensky loses support in Ukraine, before the body of the article goes on to explain that what that actually means is that 82% of Ukrainians indicated they strongly or somewhat supported Zelensky. Now, of course, the headline isn't wrong. As the article clarifies, strong and somewhat disapproval rates for Zelensky increased from 4 and 3% respectively in April to 9 and 7% in September. It also highlighted the fact that Zelensky was less popular than the armed forces, which recorded 82% strong support. And I can only guess this is meant to be surprising somehow, because obviously no population has ever rallied behind a national military while fighting a defensive war against an invading power. Now, to put that in perspective, that's a plus 66% presidential approval rating, which really isn't something we see often in democracies in the modern era. If you're looking for American examples, I don't think Ronald Reagan ever hit net 66% approval. Instead, you're talking approval on the level of George H.W. Bush right after Desert Storm. So apparently all it takes to poll positive 66% in America is to win a short, sharp, dramatic victory, taking relatively few American and coalition casualties in a war fully sanctioned and supported by the United Nations. So yes, as per the Russia Today article, Zelensky's popularity does appear to have decreased over the course of 2023 but only from the absurdly high to the merely extremely high. I think it's worth noting, however, that as you go down the chain of the Ukrainian government, approval ratings tend to drop. 41% of the polled population reported in that article disapprove of the Ukrainian prime minister. For the Rada, the Ukrainian parliament, that number is 67%. And in both cases, the Russia Today article tries to make those numbers sound even worse by comparing only the strongly approved number to the strongly and somewhat disapproving number. But leaving questions of presentation aside, there still might be some observations to make here. They might signal frustrations with individuals, organisations or institutions that aren't so much making the big presidential level decisions, how to run the country, whether to fight on, but instead actually running the country or administering the budget. And there is also just the classic phenomenon in a lot of countries that people just tend to not like their parliaments. In Ukraine, the figure might be 67% disapproval, but in a recent US poll I could find, only 13% of Americans thought Congress was doing a good job, 
and even in Russia before the 2022 invasion of Ukraine, at a time when Putin's approval rating was being quoted in the mid to high 60s, the Russian State Duma was managing 29%. And I just want to note here that that American approval rating for Congress is so low that according to one poll I found, that means that fewer Americans approve the job that Congress is doing than have a favourable view of the Islamic Republic of Iran. While the polls are absolutely apples to oranges comparisons, it's pretty dire to say that your national parliament is polling in terms of popularity, slightly above Russia and North Korea, but below a power which reportedly orchestrated attacks on US military bases and personnel. Basically, what I'm saying is if countries had to surrender every time the population had a negative approval of their parliamentarians, then the first shot of just about every war would probably just be blokes throwing white flags at each other. It probably doesn't say anything good about modern political realities, but at the same time, I wouldn't read too far into it as a measure of war exhaustion. As I said earlier, of course, there are political hot-button issues in Ukraine to do with the war. One with a lot of undeniable military significance, which is currently being quite publicly discussed in Ukraine, are questions of changes to the mobilisation system, including exemptions, the relevant age range, terms of service, and other issues besides. And this is probably a good time to deal with a question I often see come up about the armies currently fighting in Ukraine. Namely, on both the Ukrainian and Russian side, why are the troops involved, by global standards, often so old? Because often when we think of historical conflicts, we think of armies made up of troops in their late teens or early 20s. But in Ukraine, Time magazine claims the average age is north of 40. And this is sometimes advanced as proof that one or both sides are out of their younger men and are forced to send older and older people to fight. On the Ukrainian side at least, however, I'd argue the situation probably has more to do with policy and demographic decisions than the complete depletion of the younger cohorts, and this is itself a political question. In terms of population pyramids, Russia and Ukraine look relatively similar. In both cases, birth rates up to the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 were relatively strong, and so you have a comparatively large number of men in their mid-30s and above. In particular, you have a lot of men in their 40s and 50s. So if you just mobilised a representative sample of the population, ruling out retirees and literal children, then the average age you'd expect in the army in Ukraine is about 41. Then, and here's the potentially politically sensitive part, there's the way exemptions often work. Exemptions from mobilisation are a usual historical feature of most mobilisation regimes that very often end up having an unequal impact across different demographics. For example, countries like Ukraine might, under ordinary circumstances, have exemptions for men who have multiple young children, or perhaps a smaller number of very, very young children. But normally, by the time a bloke is hitting 50, the chance of him having a significant number of children under the age of 18 significantly decreases, and so too does the applicability of any exemption. Another exemption, very relevant in Ukraine, would be for those at university or going through other studies. And for those of you who have ever been on a university campus, you'll know the ages there do tend to skew younger. And while medical exemptions might be more applicable for the older cohort, Ukrainian mobilisation policy and practice so far has had significant protections for people without military experience between the ages of 18 and 27. I believe there's a proposal to lower that upper bound from 27 to 25, but that it hasn't yet taken effect. If you assumed no Ukrainians between 18 and 27 were eligible for mobilisation and none in that age range volunteered, then a representative rate of mobilisation would actually produce the Ukrainian army with an average age north of 43. So while the Russian and Ukrainian armies of early 2022 might have been made up of relatively young men, serving, for example, a standard enlistment period as a contract soldier, as the method of recruitment has turned over to mobilisation, it's not unexpected that we start seeing armies that in some ways better mirror the demographics and legal realities of the countries fielding them. So obviously, it's still interesting to look at the demographics of the soldiers we see fielded, and it may always be a politically sensitive question to just what extent a country like Ukraine should exempt or protect its limited cohort of men in their early 20s and push the burden onto older cohorts, even though, in terms of physical capabilities, men in their early 20s tend to be pretty prime recruiting material. You could also see public pressure being placed on the Ukrainian budget. There, often the complaints you'd read weren't that government was spending too much money on the war, but instead that it was wasting money on projects that weren't related to it. Perhaps in part as a result, the Ukrainian 2024 state budget is very much a war budget. More than half of all expenditures by the Ukrainian government in 2024 will reportedly be related to the war effort, with spending on domestically produced Ukraine armaments being one of the fastest growing areas. So if you're looking for an overarching picture on where the Ukrainian public stand on this war, 
after more than 600 days of fighting it. And then the core observation is that while the people and the country might be very tired, and while there is now a wider spread understanding that any victory over Russia will be incredibly hard and long fought, the numbers say the vast majority of Ukrainians wish to go on regardless. In 2022, a time when optimism might have been far higher, the polling indicated that 70% of Ukrainian respondents wanted to fight on to victory, while 25% would prefer to negotiate a settlement. Noting that, as we'll see with the Russian data, being willing to negotiate doesn't necessarily mean being willing to make concessions. Jump forward to October, where a lot of that optimism may have been dampened, and even knowing there would be no quick push to the Azov Sea, no rapid victory in 2023, a strong majority of Ukrainians still looked at this situation, the long and painful road ahead, and still said that they were willing to go on to the end. While it's always possible that that changes in the future, based on those numbers, if there is any weak link in the Ukrainian war effort or theory of victory, it probably isn't the political will or determination of the Ukrainians themselves. So if that's the Ukrainian picture, what about the Russians? As the clock turns towards the war's second winter, what can we possibly say about the Russian population and their view of the so-called special military operation? And before we spend too much time analysing that opinion, it's worth asking the question up front, to what extent does public opinion actually matter in Russia? Because one of the ultimate ways in which public opinion is meant to manifest is the ability to vote out the current leadership in a free and fair election. And it's kind of hard to have free and fair elections in a country where defenestration is an acceptable campaigning technique. Freedom House gives Russia a score of 16 out of 100 for its political and civil liberties, and many would assess that Russia is not exactly a bastion of robust democratic competition. But, and I think this is a very important but, Russia is not North Korea, where Kim Jong-un can routinely clear 99% of the quote-unquote vote, nor is it a true, pure, one-party state, where you can vote for any candidate you want as long as it's the one chosen by the current ruling party. We've seen evidence in the past that the Russian leadership are at least partially responsive to public opinion, with evidence including the partial backslide on unpopular pension reforms back in 2018, or the fact that even now it seems like the Russian government is trying to screen parts of the Russian population, particularly those living in relatively well-to-do cities like Moscow and St. Petersburg, from the worst of the impacts of the war in Ukraine. Those sort of actions are not necessarily militarily or economically efficient. The military would, for example, probably benefit from an influx of the young and technically qualified. So, one of the running hypotheses as to why those resources aren't further tapped is because, in the end, the Russian government does care what at least certain parts of the population think. In terms of trying to assess what the Russian people do think, we have to acknowledge the limitations of the data we have. Getting accurate polling in a country like Russia is always going to be complicated, in no small part because of factors that can be difficult to measure. Like, for example, the percentage of people who choose not to participate in a survey out of fear that their opinion might lead to retribution, or the percentage of people who choose to give what is considered the right answer rather than an honest one. But even with those factors in play, if we look at data over time, there might be some patterns we can identify. What the polling seems to show is that while there is a steady movement towards support for a negotiated settlement over time, for the most part, the Russian population is still divided into three broad segments. There are what might be described as the uncompromising supporters of the war, roughly 22% of the population, according to the Levada Center polling, who basically take the same stance as 60% of the Ukrainian population. No ceasefire or negotiated settlement under any circumstances, just a push on to victory. According to the pollsters, that point of view is most commonly represented amongst retirement age males, a group of the population who, all else being equal, are more likely to rely on television for their information, the state for their pension, and not to be liable for call-up or mobilisation. Then there is another share of the population, very roughly similar in size, who give what are pretty clearly anti-war responses. 19% of respondents say they don't support the actions of the Russian armed forces and are willing to make concessions to Ukraine in exchange for peace. That last part is important because for peace to be negotiated, the demands of both sides have to be compatible. 55% of Russian respondents say they would support an immediate ceasefire. That number increases to 72% if you add on the people who would consider it acceptable. But only 22% say they would be willing to give back Kherson and Zaporizhia, noting that in Russia simply saying that you support the return of those regions might be enough to get you into significant legal trouble, and stated support for the return of Luhansk and Donetsk is merely 16%. What that seems to suggest is that there is a large blob in the middle of the Russian population who don't feel particularly strongly on the war and generally take the position that they would be happy if there was a peace declared tomorrow, but aren't willing to test Russian law by questioning Russia's sovereignty over areas like Zaporizhia and Kherson. 
And in the meantime, the standard response seems to be relatively passive acceptance of the war as just another reality, staying out of it, not making too much noise, and letting the government do its thing. Those top-level figures don't seem to suggest anything like a critical level of war exhaustion. And if you were a government strategist looking at those figures, you'd probably think, hey, this conflict might be fairly sustainable. That might be true to an extent, but there is a massive blip in the data that suggests there might be a giant caveat on that point. And that is that there is a segment of the population that seem happy enough to just let the war happen, as long as it doesn't too significantly impact them or those around them. What you're looking at here is long-term polling data on how Russians assess their own mood, how they think things are going. As you can see, during the 1990s, a majority of the Russian population responded that things were a bit shit. Unsurprising, perhaps, because this was 1990s Russia, and even Slavs have an upper limit on how much awful they'll tolerate. But cue the 2000s, things got better, and even the 2014 or 2022 invasions of Ukraine weren't enough to significantly move the needle. Until one brief point where, for a brief moment, when suddenly the ratings started crashing back towards late 1990s levels. That was the point where Russia declared a mobilization, but before it became clear that, that mobilization wasn't going to affect significant parts of the population in a major way. During the brief moment where Russians weren't sure who exactly was going to be called up to fight in practice, public sentiment suffered something of a shock, which is interesting because it might provide a clue as to how deep some of the stated support for the war goes. And if you're trying to assess what percentage of the population Russia might be able to mobilize going forward to fight in Ukraine, data points like this suggest there might, politically speaking, be an upper limit. The Ukrainians might be willing to accept large-scale general mobilization, but a lot of Russians, it seems, would greatly prefer that someone else did the fighting and dying for them, please and thank you. And so it seems like the Russian government has often made policy decisions designed to insulate significant parts of the population from feeling most of the impacts of the war. Mobilization quotas are relatively higher in rural and disadvantaged areas. Recruitment campaigns based around offers of very high salaries or signing bonuses, well, those are going to be naturally more attractive in economically depressed rural areas, often with a significant non-ethnic Russian population, than they are in relatively affluent urban areas. We've also seen the Russian government tapping the prison system as a source of recruits. We haven't got an exact number on how many prisoners were recruited into organizations like Wagner or the Russian military itself. But before the February 2022 invasion, Russia's prison population was estimated at about 420,000. In October, Russia's deputy justice minister said the current number was now 266,000. Your guess is obviously as good as mine as to where the 154,000 prisoners that disappeared from that starting figure may have gone. Government efforts to fund the war have usually focused on corporate revenues, tapping the National Wealth Fund, taking out additional debt, or a range of other mechanisms as opposed to raising funds directly from the civilian population, for example, through increased taxes. And even relatively early in 2022, when sanctions and the war were starting to drive inflation, the government intervened with increases to minimum wages and pensions, all of which helped to limit the extent to which many Russian citizens would personally feel the extreme economic cost that came with fighting the war. That's a cost that's probably only going to increase as we move into 2024. Russia's 2024 budget plans for a roughly 25% increase in spending over 2023 levels, with a significant 40% of revealed expenditures being for defence or national security, and the defence spending line item increasing by approximately 70% over 2023 levels. Now, in terms of trying to assess how much of an increase in production a 70% increase in budget actually represents is going to be difficult. You have to account for the effects of the devaluing ruble, inflation, increased soldier pay and benefits, payments to the families of the wounded or dead, and the cost of compensating the defence industrial base for the lost profitability that comes from reduced sales to foreign buyers. But even though all this is likely to be expensive and drive a shortfall of investment in other public-facing areas like healthcare, education and infrastructure, in the short term it might drive GDP growth, decreased unemployment and increased salaries. Because the government is essentially pointing the money cannon at the defence sector, hoping to get a bunch of actual cannons in return, and as a result, the defence factories and all of the supporting industries and services need all the workers they can get. Historical precedent, for example, the First and Second World Wars, indicate that you can hold up GDP using this kind of method basically for as long as the wartime stimulus spending lasts. The real danger starts when the music stops, the jobs in the factories disappear, and all of those personnel you mobilised into the armed forces now have to come home and want jobs too. But from the point of view of mobilising the Russian population against the war, you probably need pain now, not pain after it's all over.
and I can't see anything in this wartime budget that would obviously and significantly spike public discontent with the war in the short to medium term. So where then does that leave us in terms of a general assessment of Russian morale and war exhaustion? I think the data generally suggests four key takeaways. Firstly, support for carrying on the war to a decisive victory is weaker in Russia than it is in Ukraine. But at the same time, public support is at least strong enough that the Russian government probably doesn't feel any significant pressure right now from a majority of the public to seek peace. Unless, of course, that peace is very much on Russia's terms. The third point, however, and the key caveat, is that Russian public opinion does appear to become sensitive whenever it looks like the war might significantly impact them or those close to them personally. That means things might remain relatively stable as long as the government is able to insulate significant parts of the population from the worst impacts of the war. But if, for example, it was to start forcibly mobilising larger and larger portions of the population, well, we've already got some good data suggesting that might be a bit of a shock to the system. And the reason that things like that might matter, from the perspective of a long war, is that even though Russia enjoys a significant advantage in population and economic output over Ukraine, if it is significantly more limited in the share of those resources that it can mobilise, then suddenly the effective gap in military potential between the two countries might not be nearly as extreme as the raw numbers suggest. For now, that concern might be mostly hypothetical. But the longer the war goes and the greater Russian casualties climb, the more pressure there might be on the Russian government to draw on the human and economic resources that have so far been mostly untouchable. But one assessment of Russian strategy in Ukraine might be that they don't intend the war to go on forever. Their theory of victory might not even rest on exhausting Ukrainian political will per se. Instead, one of Russia's more credible pathways towards securing at least some concessions in Ukraine might not be exhausting Ukrainian will, but rather that of its allies. And when you're talking about key Ukrainian allies and major military suppliers, the first country you're probably going to think of is the United States of America. For Russia, the United States is a key actor. It's a central power in NATO and has enormous financial and military resources available to it. Trying to exhaust those resources would be practically an impossible ask. While there might be shortages and limitations in certain categories like artillery shells, for example, there are plenty of capability reserves that remain almost entirely untouched. And so far, a country with the world's largest fighter force has donated zero fighters. One of the largest tank fleets has donated 30 tanks. And the standard for whether or not a munitional system can be supplied to Ukraine has often been whether it can be supplied to Ukraine without in any way impacting the ability of the United States to answer other contingencies around the world. That is very different from the approach of some European nations that have dug deep into their active equipment stockpiles, or the Russians themselves who are throwing just about everything they have available at the war in Ukraine. And so the question probably isn't, does the United States have the resources necessary to support Ukraine? But rather, is it willing to do so? And will it be willing to do so into the future? In March of 2022, sending military assistance to Ukraine was largely a bipartisan issue in the United States. As an outsider looking in, noting I don't like to talk too much about US politics, it looked for a while like Ukraine aid might be a rare exception to the pattern of just about everything becoming ultra-polarised in the American political space. Over time, however, that polarisation has begun to manifest, and it does come through if you look at the changes in the polling data over time. According to Gallup polling, in January of 2023, there were more Americans who thought Ukraine wasn't receiving enough aid than there were those who thought it was receiving too much, 30% of respondents to 28%. The largest group of 39% in the middle seemed to have thought the administration had hit the Goldilocks zone and that aid was about right. Jump forward to October when it had become clear the Ukrainian offensive for the year wouldn't go as far as was hoped, and the numbers were now 41% too much to 25% too little. Looking at these numbers, there's probably a bit of good news and bad news that just about everyone involved in this war can find. For the Russians, the good news is the numbers are generally heading in the correct direction. 41 is a significantly larger number than 28. And if that figure ever became a significant majority, members of Congress might be harder pressed to sign off on new aid packages. Another thing the Russians might be happy with, and the Ukrainians disappointed with, is the fact that the levels of American support to date, while significant, have arguably fallen far short of what America has the capacity to do and what the Ukrainians would probably like them to do. Cruise missiles, more advanced munitions, significantly larger numbers of armoured vehicles, additional air defence batteries, the list goes on and on and on. Even the simple policy decision not to allow long-range US weapons to be used against recognised Russian territory is another example. And with only about a quarter of Americans saying that the current aid is too little, the pressure on the administration to significantly dial things up to match the identified military needs probably just isn't going to be there.
at least not coming from the public. At the same time, if you want to flip your narrative hat around for a moment, there's a lot here that's pretty depressing for the Russians. The fall in support for additional aid has not been linear and continuous over time, and you still have a decent majority of respondents supporting at least the current aid levels, which is really significant because even if the current aid levels are nothing compared to what the United States could hypothetically do, by the standards of just about everywhere else in the world, the request of $60 billion for 2024 is enough to make a major difference in the way the fighting plays out. US military aid so far may have fallen far short of US potential, but it's still been enough to help the Ukrainians inflict tremendous damage on the Russian armed forces and grind their way through thousands of thousands of vehicles and inflict potentially hundreds of thousands killed and wounded on one of America's main strategic rivals, all without a single active American unit being sent to the front lines. Which also touches on another issue for Russia when you start to break down these figures and look into the spectrum they represent. For example, saying you think too much aid is going to Ukraine doesn't mean you don't think any aid should go to Ukraine. And even if you think that number should be dialed back by 20 or 30%, that's still an awful lot of ordnance and things that go boom. At the same time, while media attention often tends to focus on Ukraine aid skeptics in the United States, it's worth noting that polling suggests there's a very motivated core of Americans out there who are very, very supportive. For example, as recently as September, a Chicago Council survey asked the question, in response to the situation involving Russia and Ukraine, would you support or oppose the United States sending US troops to help the Ukrainian government defend itself against Russia? And 25% of respondents basically said, yes, send in the troops and let's get this finished. That figure presumably wasn't high enough to cause Ronald Reagan to spontaneously rise from his grave alongside the likes of Patton and MacArthur. But who knows what would happen if the numbers went higher? More seriously, the reason I highlight these sort of outliers is because it highlights how strongly people might hold a particular belief. If you're not particularly engaged, perhaps a bit neutral over this whole Ukraine thing, your opinion might be liable to change significantly over time. But if your approach today is that you'd be willing to risk a kinetic conflict with a nuclear armed state just to help Ukraine defend itself, then it's probably going to take an awful lot to convince you that Ukraine should be basically left to its fate. American public support for Ukrainian aid may have dwindled somewhat, but most polls still assess it to be the more popular opinion, and it's an open question how much support levels may change further in the future. There's also a question here, I think, about what arguments have pushed American public opinion so far, and whether the US administration has really done a good job of explaining to the population what aid is actually being sent, and what the payoff for the United States and its interests is. An interesting observation here, for example, is that while the share of the American population who think too much aid is being sent has grown, public opinion of Russia remains in the absolute toilet. The arguments that appear to be biting don't so much seem to be Russia good, but rather a mixture of isolationist or domestic-centric arguments combined with criticisms of Ukraine. A vast majority of American Republicans, for example, still describe Ukraine as either an American ally or a partner, but about half of Republicans say Ukraine is a partner nation that doesn't share US values. And I think it might be some manifestation of that thinking when you see figures like Lindsey Graham, very much a pro-Ukraine aid American Republican senator, coming out and saying that it's very important that Ukraine holds elections in 2024 to show it's democratic. The issue, however, is the Ukrainian constitution says that you can't have elections during a state of martial law, and Ukraine has, as you might expect, been in a state of martial law since it experienced a massive border security issue in February 2022. So delaying elections is exactly what the Ukrainian constitution requires, but the fact that Ukrainian leaders are respecting that legal requirement has been mobilized into an argument to suggest that Ukraine isn't really a democracy and doesn't share US values. This, of course, puts Ukraine alongside other famous dictatorships like the United Kingdom, which didn't hold its scheduled general elections in 1916 or 1940 due to those little events known as the First and Second World Wars. But as we established right back at the beginning, often in the end, it's the perception that matters. Another observation that probably needs a little more testing is the correlation between support for Ukraine aid and perceptions of whether or not Ukraine is winning the war. One purely hypothetical thesis here might be the American public are a little bit jaded after supporting the likes of the Afghan National Army for 20 years or so only to have the whole thing fall apart as soon as they walked away. So there appears to be at least some soft correlation between the share of Americans who believe Ukraine is winning the war at any given time and the share who support further aid. And what that arguably does is put Ukraine in a position that would be familiar to anyone who's ever applied to a job, hoping to get some experience, only to be told they need experience to get the job. 
Ukraine needs to show progress in order to get military aid, and it needs military aid in order to show progress. But in any case, from both a Ukrainian and Russian perspective, as far as the war in Ukraine in 2024 is concerned, the fight now is probably not so much for American public opinion. Instead, with previously voted funds for Ukraine now basically run down, the question is instead whether a new aid package can go through US Congress by the end of the year. And as frustrating as this must be to the troops fighting and sacrificing in Ukraine at the moment, I'd argue that one of the most consequential battles of the Ukraine war in 2023 isn't taking place in Ukraine at all, but rather in the back and forth negotiations of the US Congress. Because the aid package the US administration has now requested is quite different from some of the others we've seen. In the past, when supporting Ukraine aid packages was quick and easy, the requests tended to come in individual supplementals one after the other. That meant planners could design each package in sequence, and Congress could partially resist larger individual commitments. Now instead, the approach has morphed to one and done, a larger request that projects requirements out through 2024 to be voted on as a single package of about 60 billion US dollars. If that passes by the end of the year, the US administration will have the financial resources it needs to continue supporting Ukraine in a major way through 2024. Not to the extent that they can match Russian resources one-to-one, but certainly to an extent that they can sustain existing capabilities and build new ones. And that's true even if Congress doesn't debate or vote a single additional dollar for Ukraine in the first half of 2024. By contrast, if the aid doesn't pass, then there are probably going to be serious questions over Ukraine's ability to resupply and get through the winter and regenerate combat power for the 2024 campaign season. Other allies, like those in Europe, can try and fill the gap, but the US has a lot of military potential and leaves very large shoes to fill. If the aid does pass, then one of the next big strategic considerations becomes what happens during the US elections in 2024. There are obviously significant differences between the parties and different presidential candidates on what the American policy approach to Ukraine should be going forward. And while American leaders now can of course say that they'll be with Ukraine as long as it takes, a future administration may or may not choose to follow the same policy. And to an extent, that US election date may now be playing into Russian planning. As we've discussed in the past, we don't have any evidence yet that Russia has given up on its previously stated war goals. They still demand that any peace agreement hands them Zaporizhia, Kherson, Crimea, Luhansk and Donetsk, as well as a range of additional conditions. It's also hopefully clear by now that actually taking all of that territory isn't really something the Russian military can do unless something very dramatic changes. Recently, we saw a speech by Sergei Shoigu in which he said the Russian military needs to be prepared to fight in Ukraine until at least 2025. There are obviously plenty of ways to interpret that, and I'm not a Kremlin whisperer, but it does seem like a mighty large coincidence that they're saying they need to last until at least 2025, when 2025 is also the year when any administration elected in November 2024 would take office. And it might be that the Russian theory of victory is not so much grinding Ukraine down or decisively defeating them in the field, but instead simply waiting for a major political shift among Ukraine's allies, at which point with Ukraine partly or entirely cut off from vital external supply, Russia might try to reclaim battlefield momentum and force concessions. It's a pretty morbid thought to suggest that Putin might be willing to expend lives and materiel, in part just to wait and see which way the political winds in America blow. But viewed through the lens of Russia's stated territorial objectives, carrying on the war until they're convinced that decisive levels of Western aid will actually be enduring may be one of the best and only options remaining to them. Moving on, the final actor I wanted to look at today is the European Union. Because while the United States arguably has strong strategic interests in supporting Ukraine against Russia, for many members of the much more proximate European Union, the interest is arguably even more acute. EU nations were the dominant equipment suppliers in several equipment categories in 2022, including tanks, aircraft and infantry fighting vehicles, and through 2023 they've been critical in supporting the Ukrainian economy, while in some cases also being the only suppliers of certain critical systems. So far, for example, all of Ukraine's air launch cruise missiles have come from European states, as will all of the F-16 fourth-generation fighters pledged to the country so far. So while the European states probably don't have the capacity to fully replace American military aid were it to be withdrawn, breaking down European support for Ukraine is probably still a critical Russian objective. To that end, in 2022 and early 2023, we had the height of the energy war, where supplies of Russian natural gas and oil into European markets declined massively, 
and Russian propagandists variously predicted everything from a total European economic collapse to most of the continent effectively freezing in their homes over the course of the winter. Obviously, that didn't happen, but energy prices did see a tremendous spike. Nonetheless, it wasn't enough to catalyse an end to European aid to Ukraine in 2022-23. This year, it doesn't look like the squeeze is going to be anywhere near as bad. New energy importation infrastructure has been rapidly built, efficiency upgrades intended to lower consumption have been made on a massive level, and as at time of recording, European gas prices are a mere fraction of what they were this time last year. And the European Union's gas storages, having never dropped below 50%, even in the depth of the winter, are currently filled with even more stored gas than they were holding this time in 2022. Oh, and the current forecast is for an exceedingly warm and mild winter in Europe yet again, noting that last year's warmer-than-average winter was responsible for a significant proportion of the energy savings registered in Europe. That doesn't mean, of course, that everyone in Europe is doing it easy. Across the block, GDP growth is narrowly positive and inflation has come down, but factors like significant inflation and the cost of basic essentials like food means there are absolutely people out there doing it tough. The key point, however, is that while European nations have experienced some pain, arguably significantly more than the United States did, conditions appear to be trending better than they were last year. And for most EU nations, Russia now probably just doesn't have that many economic screws that it can still turn. So the question is, after an economically disruptive winter and a Ukrainian offensive which didn't meet expectations, has Putin succeeded in breaking European public support for Ukraine? And going on the latest Eurobarometer data, which I've put on screen here, noting that here I've removed the I don't know responses just to make the contrast a bit clearer, but I'll link the original data in the description. The answer to that question so far can probably be expressed in the language of my generation as lol no. On topics like imposing and maintaining sanctions on Russia or integrating Ukraine into the European Union, supporters outnumber opponents by more than two to one. And even on the most controversial measure, providing or funding military equipment and training to Ukrainian forces, supporters outnumbered opponents by more than six to four. Compared to the support levels recorded over last winter, these figures do represent a reduction, but those reductions were generally both relatively modest and more apparent on issues like welcoming Ukrainian refugees into the European Union than on topics like providing military equipment and training. And in the case of the one item that bucked the trend, support for imposing and maintaining economic sanctions on Russia actually appears to have gone up between the two surveys. There is, however, a key factor with the European Union that makes using just top-level aggregate figures a little bit deceptive. The European Union is ultimately a union of nations. It makes decisions primarily by consensus, and opinions can vary greatly, country to country, government to government. And so while overall public support for Ukraine in the European Union remains very high, we have seen figures like Hungary's Viktor Orban repeatedly threatening to delay, block or obstruct efforts to either support Ukraine or push forward with efforts to advance it towards EU member status, which, given Hungary borders Ukraine, is kind of like seeing your neighbour's house on fire and deciding that you are not just going to refrain from helping them, you're going to start throwing some spike strips down on the road outside your house just to make sure help from anywhere else can't get there quickly either. There is, of course, a little more nuance to the position the Hungarian government has taken, and I want to look more at that in future. But for now, the potential veto power of countries like Hungary and Slovakia have very real, immediate relevance. Because later this month, the European Union will be voting on a budget package which includes 50 billion euros in additional aid to Ukraine over the years 2024 through 2027. That's entirely separate from the individual pledges we've seen many European countries make and would be a major boost to Ukrainian financial stability. If the package is blocked, there may be a number of ways for the European Union to potentially get around an effective Hungarian veto. But until the funds are committed, there'll probably be some in Kyiv and Moscow watching very, very closely. Because just like majority opposition doesn't guarantee that a measure will go down or a war will be ended, majority public support doesn't mean everything in a world where vetoes exist. Not subject to any European veto, however, is assistance from the United Kingdom. The UK has, of course, been operating under many of the same constraints as some of its European peers. The economy has faced significant challenges, and the British military, because it was designed to fight a very different war than the one we're seeing in Ukraine, only has a relatively limited stock of equipment suitable for that sort of fighting which it's been able to provide. But Britain has still been one of Ukraine's most significant backers for a range of reasons. It's often been critical in breaking the taboos on supplying certain weapon systems like Western main battle tanks or air-launched cruise missiles, has been a major contributor to training efforts for the Ukrainian military, 
and has proven at times incredibly creative in finding weapons on global markets to source for Ukraine. It's a valuable role, and based on the data we have, it seems like one that's likely to continue. Looking at data gathered in Q3 this year, 85% of British respondents said they support ongoing humanitarian aid to Ukraine, a very strong majority supported ongoing military support for Ukraine, and approximately 53% of respondents said they supported that military support being provided for as long as it takes. The British political situation is also quite different from the American one, in the sense that aid to Ukraine is still largely bipartisan between the Conservatives and Labour. My understanding is much of the UK's currently voted aid for Ukraine expires in March, and one of the lines of attack taken by Labour attacking the existing Conservative government is that while the German government has published a target figure of 8 billion euros worth of military aid to Ukraine in 2024, the UK government, as at time of recording, haven't published an equivalent figure. Basically, for the moment, UK aid to Ukraine is baked in by partisan policy. Now, of course, that doesn't mean you can't get some interesting headlines regardless. Back in October, for example, I saw an article that said that just half of the UK population supported sending UK troops into Ukraine to help train Ukrainian forces, and this was used to suggest, quote, the survey suggests support for Ukraine is wavering, end quote. Now, I don't really know where to start with that one. Firstly, the figure was more than 50% positive to 31% negative, with the rest being unknowns, and that seems like it might have been pertinent information to include. But I'd also just suggest that it's an interesting take to say that majority support for sending British troops into harm's way in Ukraine suggests wavering British support for Ukraine. That's kind of like saying your support for a friend is wavering because you'd rather only give them one of your two kidneys. Putting boots on the ground is a pretty extreme step, and one that officially all of Ukraine's allies have been reluctant to do. But look, I bring this up not to harp on any particular article or headline, but instead just to stress that whenever you see a headline, do try and find the figures that sit behind it. Well, if we zoom out and ask the question of whether or not UK support for Ukraine is generally holding, I think the pretty strong answer for now, statistically speaking, is yes with the biggest threat to UK aid to Ukraine coming not so much from public opinion, but instead from arguably the greatest opponent of nearly all British military ventures for the past several centuries, the Exchequer. Okay, so we've gone through the theory and where many of the major powers involved are at in terms of public opinion and support. What then might that tell us about overall fatigue levels in Ukraine and what we might expect for the war in 2024? Observation one is that the Ukrainians themselves are committed. While support for total victory may have dampened by a couple of percentage points since the start of the year, every indication is, for now at least, that Ukraine is willing to mobilise the resources it needs to and fight as long and hard as it has to in order to repel the Russian invasion. The undisputable reality, however, is that in order to fight the Russian armed forces effectively, Ukraine will need ongoing military and financial assistance from its various partners and allies. That, in turn, means the way this war goes probably has a lot to do with the extent to which political and public support holds up in those allied countries. The data we looked over suggests that some fatigue is being felt in those countries, particularly when you're talking about the United States. But at the same time, support levels are still holding in positive territory in the US, EU and UK. And if that support manifests in the passage of major packages, like the proposed US 2024 aid package or the European Union's multi-year one, then I suspect the effect on the Russian army in Ukraine is going to be keenly felt. If that's the case, the question then becomes to what extent Russia can mobilise its own resources in order to compensate. And if so, whether the Russian strategy of attrition and exhaustion ultimately ends up paying dividends in late 2024. In conclusion, I want to throw back all the way to the first episode I did on the war in Ukraine, All Bling No Basics. In that episode, recorded during February and released March 2022, I put forward a couple of key arguments. The first was that the war between Russia and Ukraine was much closer than many in the media were portraying it at the time. The second was that Russia hadn't built the right sort of army for the kind of campaign it was trying to fight in February and March. And the final one was that if the West had the political will to do so, it had the necessary economic and military resources to help Ukraine win a victory. Jump forward to the end of 2023, and I think each of those core points still holds. This war is still a closely fought affair. The Russian military has had to adapt and change the way it fights, and Western political will and assistance is still probably the greatest unknown. So far, military assistance to Ukraine has been significant, but also hesitant and arguably fallen far short of what's ultimately needed. In a sense, Russia and Ukraine may be taking opposing bets on whether that will ultimately holds, with Ukraine betting that it will receive the support necessary to ultimately exhaust and overcome the Russians, 
while Russian leaders seem to be making a strategic bet that they can endure the immense casualties and costs longer than Ukraine's allies will choose to keep up the assistance. Only time will ultimately tell whether that bet turns out to be a good one or a disastrous one. Okay, channel update to close out, and I will keep this brief. Firstly, I was travelling a lot this week as I recorded this one, so apologies if the sound quality jumps back and forth a couple of times. Secondly, thank you to all of you who put forward questions for the Q&A episode. I've received a lot more questions, both from patrons and regular subscribers than I expected, and it also got a tremendous amount of likes and additional engagement, so I'm actually considering making that a full episode and releasing it as the release next week. After that, I have something special planned for the following week's release, and the long-awaited episode on India should be coming towards the end of this year. I'll save the reflections on just what a year it's been for a little bit later in the month, but until then, let me just as always say thank you for your ongoing support, and that I'll see you all again next week.